Phil's the director for HDST, and uh, he's worked at companies like Oracle, Panzura, and Nirvonic. So we found him in the back, so he's okay. That's the main thing. So Phil, come on up. Good morning. So one of the things when they asked me to do the speech today was when I looked at the agenda, I said, at least I'm not having to go on before lunch and keep you off from your lunch. But I have to tell you, as a Southern California native and a child who grew up at Disneyland, when you get a fast pass to Space Mountain, you take it. So I apologize for being late. We'll run through this, do the best I can to get you to lunch on time. Um, I'm from HGST, which many of you don't know, and one of the things I want to run through is uh, we're a subsidiary, a brand of Western Digital Corporation. We put a little timeline up here. I like to think of this, especially in light of where we are today, as the, the HGST, or the WDC Carousel of Progress. For those of you who grew up at Disneyland, you remember the GE Carousel of Progress? Everyone sing along with me? Okay. Um, but yeah, we started off, we invented the hard drive when we were IBM storage technology back in 1956, which is about when Disneyland started. You can see it there in the back. It's a wax cylinder that, uh, uh, that we got from uh, the folks over in New Jersey um, from the old phonograph. But um, over, the, over the years, we've innovated beyond that. Over the last 60 years, we've also done a number of major acquisitions. Western Digital bought HGST and just recently acquired SanDisk as well. Um, and so now we have these three brands aligned under the WDC umbrella with three separate focuses. So primarily HGST is focused on the enterprise, enterprise storage. WD, the brand, Western Digital, is our consumer brand. And SanDisk is the brand you know and love for things like very high performance solid state storage. Now the joke internally is we bought SanDisk just for the name recognition because nobody knew who WD and HGST were. But one of the things we got with SanDisk that was really important was our fab. So SanDisk in partnership with Toshiba builds 40% of the NAND in the world, um, which makes them the largest NAND manufacturer um, worldwide. As you can see from the photo, it's fully automated. When I showed this picture to my kids, they said, wow, you guys, got, now I know what the guys from Daft Punk are doing now. Um, and so when we say it's fully automated, we're not kidding. That's like Westworld. But there are a lot of challenges in data. And even with the world's largest NAND, we can't satisfy the requirements in the organization, or the organizations worldwide. As you can see from the graph, the white bars with the tiny, tiny letters are the amount of data that's, that's being created year over year. The yellow is right now the amount of useful data being created. So there's already a disparity between the amount of data that gets created and the amount of data that's thrown away. Now the blue bar is the amount of storage that's being shipped. So this really green swoopy curve is where we see a need for new storage technologies to emerge to fill that gap. Now we know that people are looking at data that typically gets thrown away. People's cell phone images, that sort of thing. This is information that can be mined. This is information that can be useful for a lot of different reasons. Some of them commercial, some of them altruistic. Here's a really good example of a place where we're seeing tremendous amount of storage consumption um, and an increase in storage consumption, and this is in life sciences. The graph on the left shows uh, genome, gene sequencing, the amount of data that's being collected by gene sequencing. It's doubling, depending on which curve you use, the red curve is what, we, what the market's actually telling us. The yellow and blue curves are our predictions for growth. So clearly they're out, the, the, the industry is actually outpacing what we expect them to do. On the right side, you're seeing a before and after from digital microscopy. So just a few years ago, a single digital image of a digital microscope was about 15 gigabytes of data. Currently, 3.75 terabytes with every slide out of that microscope. So data's getting bigger, storage has to get bigger to catch up. But we also know that we need to get faster. We just did, recently did an engagement with a children's hospital where their focus is using gene sequencing technology and analytics to help to diagnose infants in distress. Now, most of the infants that go through this hospital have a life expectancy of about 60 days. Now, the typical gene sequencing timeframe 
is days. Six days, seven days is not uncommon. For a child with a 60-day life expectancy, you're looking at something that for you as an adult with a normal life expectancy, you'd have to wait five to seven years for that diagnosis. That's obviously far too slow to get the information they need to help these kids. So storage not only has to get bigger, it has to get faster as well. Now sadly, the one thing that we know isn't getting bigger is our IT budgets. Data growth is getting bigger, demand for data is getting bigger, it's got to be faster. I keep asking our guys in development to make sure that a beer tap comes into our next appliance, but so far that's low on the list. But the one thing that isn't growing is budgets, so we also not only have to make it bigger and faster, we have to make it more cost effective. Fortunately for you, we have the answer. The answer, as I heard a number of the people before me come on and say, is storage tiering. Now when I was doing IT, performance meant spindles. And in many cases, I'd over-provision my storage to get the IOPS I needed. Now, the benefit was, if I, needed, if I needed 300 gig out of my SAN, I'd buy a terabyte your worth. So I was an IT guy a long time ago. Um, but the benefit was I could use that extra space for stuff that I didn't need the performance for, but it was free space. So in an example here on the screen, we're working with another, vendor, or another um, organization here in Southern California that still has that traditional approach to storage. And what we showed them was by taking the 15% of the active data, that 85% of the passive data off of their tier one storage, moving the 85% to object store, moving the 15% to a flash tier, improve their performance by 20 times for the data that really mattered, improve their analytics performance, but also reduce their overall costs by 20, 27%. And also gave them much more space on their archi archival tier. So in the end, you know, these are the kinds of things that are gonna change the world. And I know that, you know, it's one of those things, I mean, I have kids, and I, I kind of hate it when people use their children or their wives to make a point. Because really, I mean, from a humanistic perspective, these are just things we should all do. But certainly, having kids helps me to kind of look at where I am, reevaluate my life. And what I, one of the things I'm fond of telling them is, it's good to do well, but it's also good to do good while you do well. And while I have a past in law enforcement and, and healthcare and, and educational technology, so in my job here at Western Digital, I make discs. It's hard to say I'm doing good. However, I know that in one of the benefits of my job of meeting customers, of getting to see what these people do, is that we're powering the people who will cure cancer. We're powering and we're empowering the people who are gonna solve some of these childhood diseases. When you open up that HPE server, when you look under the hood of those big compute clouds, you're gonna see that that storage technology enables the folks, some of you who are here in the room, to do those really fantastic things. So it's good to be a part of that. Um, and it also is important for us to bring that knowledge of how we can change the way they do things. Because a lot of these technologies are transformational. SSD is not just faster disk. Large scale storage is not just bigger is better. So what we, all, what we know, our job, when we engage with customers, when we engage with our partners, is how do we help them to understand the fundamental differences in these technologies and how they change the way we do business. So for instance, you, know, you hear it a lot, I hear it with customers all the time, you know, having been in Having a deep background in storage for the months and months I've been doing it, um, that was a joke, I'm sorry. You guys are hungry. Um, <laughs> you hear a lot that SSD is just, it's like disk but only better. It's faster. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's more performant, it's, it's less cost for, you know, to operate. No moving parts, nothing to break, it's solid state. Sadly, that's mostly true. But as we know from the movie, mostly true is not all true. Um, so what we're seeing is, and, and you know, it really comes down to when we talk to customers and they look at our offerings at the enterprise level, the consumer level, they're like, why do you have so many types of SSDs? Why do you have so many types of disks? Aren't they all the same? The fact is, no, they're not. So what you're seeing up here is we're comparing the, the, the features around the four different types of SSDs, three of which are on the market today, one of which is emerging, that's QLC. And ultimately, the differences are the number of bits per cell, the, the, the cellular density of the disk. Now, you'll see down below, 
for those of you who don't know, this is kind of the quick primer on storage or, or SSD technology, is unlike a disk, we don't change data, we write and we erase. Everything is immutable. Once it's written, it's never changed. Changing it involves erasing that cell and rewriting it. And those cells aren't forever. They have a finite life, and depending on the type of storage it is, whether it's SLC, which is single level, multi-level, three level, or quad level, four level, um, you see that there's a certain growth. For the SLC, we only can store two power states. It's a binary storage device. But as we grow and we get to the quad level, we now store 16 power states in those four bits. Um, so we're getting tremendous growth in storage capacity. The challenge is when you look at the program and erase cycles, which are just below it, you start to see some of the trade-offs. With SLC, it is almost limitless in its use. You can rewrite that stuff all day long. When you get to the QLC levels, and this is still an emerging technology, so these numbers are really squishy. Um, the attorneys, when we, they look, took the list as our, our internal legal folks, which I like to consider my exit interview. These, these numbers are public. These numbers are estimates. <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's like the, the, the disclaimer at the end of the commercial. These numbers don't represent real truth. You know, they don't represent anything that uh, is a trade secret. Um, however, it is a good indication of where, when you get to those high density storage, that very cheap QLC storage, you're also gonna see that you've got a couple of hundred write cycles before the system fails. Does that mean it's garbage? No, it just means you have to know where to use it. So where my prediction for QLC is you're gonna start seeing flash moving into archival tiers. If you have a worm device where you're only gonna to write to it once, QLC flash might be the right answer. But is it where you're gonna put your database? Probably not. Um, the other takeaway here, and it's a typo on the slide, um, is the erase times are also listed in microseconds. They're not, they're milliseconds. And that really is the problem. That's the long tail in the process. So as I said, a PE cycle is program and erase. So if you're writing to a disk and you run out of space on that disk, the erase is gonna slow everything down. So what typically happens is we over-provision those disks. There's more storage in that SSD than you think there is. And that's to give us a little space to catch up on the erases. Um, the other challenge in SSDs is write amplification. When you're doing random writes, you're, ex you're, you're starting to move data. The system behind the scenes will start to take blocks of data, not just the data you wanted to write, and move it around the disk to make it more performance. It's doing pruning, it's doing housekeeping. That tends to increase those PE cycles that you have to have on the disk. So we like sequentials. Randoms aren't great, but this is where you're gonna wanna take a very critical view at what your workload is when you choose what SSD to use. We do make the disks, on the SSD disks, that are built for random, random cycles. So you, you have to, it's very important, and one of the things we, we're very, very strict about when we talk with customers is know your, know your workload, pick the appropriate platform. It's, it's rarely about cost. Another good place where we look at write amplification is folks who do have encryption requirements or they need secure erase. Because if you're looking at doing it in software and you're thinking, I don't need the, S, the said chip on the, on the drive, I can do it myself, I know AES-256 backward and forward, that becomes another PE cycle on your disk. And if you're doing selective deletes, you're really gonna beat that disk to death. So it's another case where if security is important, if encryption is important, get that said chip, it's worth its weight in gold. Lastly, drive right days. Drive right days is just, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but ultimately every disk has a finite amount of data we can write to it. This is, a, this is basically just an estimate of how much data you can write to that disk per day to keep it useful within its, its, lim, or within its warranty period. And we'll, we'll have a minor example of it um, later on. So, well, here it is. You have two disks. Like I said, this is, this is something I show to customers when we talk about, aren't all SSDs the same? Well, they're not. Here's two, there's two very extreme examples. They're both enterprise class SSD. They both have the same MTBF rating. They both have the same, the same interface. One of them is rated for 45 drive writes per day. You can take that 400 gig drive and write 400 gigs to it 45 times a day for five years, and it will not fail. The other disk on the other side is rated for half a drive write per day. It's also bigger, four terabytes. But with that one, you can write two terabytes a day to it all day long for five years. So you can see that there's, 
ultimately, different disks, different workloads. One's going to be far more focused on highly uh, dynamic workloads like database activities or maybe caching. The other one's going to be far more for archival. And under the hood, it's not like they're the same disk. There are differences in architecture. We'll do things around you know, the controllers, onboard caching, the level of, of housekeeping and, and garbage collection we do to ensure that that disk performs for the workload in which it's designed. Because otherwise, I just sell you a bunch of these. <laughs> if I could, I mean, and we've tried it. Just for fun, me and some of the technical guys built a Hadoop cluster out of Raspberry Pis powered by a bunch of uh, SanDisk flash uh, SD cards. And let me tell you, what few gray's hair I had left jumped out of my head before the damn thing finished uh, the query. It was horrible, but it works. Um, but it's a really good, very extreme example that not all SSD, not all flash is the same, and it's all performant within, within the, the constraints of your workflow. Lastly, QoS is another one we talk about a lot. This is very important to some people. It's another example of where it's not just about speed or cost or size. I worked with a uh, high-frequency trader in New York. Same folks who spent a billion dollars a few years ago to run a new fiber optic cable across the Atlantic Ocean in order to shave a few milliseconds off the time between London, New York, and Chicago. For them, performance was less important than consistency. They didn't really care because they could always increase performance by scaling out. But what they cared about was that every request that disk, every query came back within the same parameters. If they asked for something and the disk was mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, had its little shower cap on, that was gonna be a problem. And for, consum for consumer grade SSD, that 99th percentile latency can, can be 30 times as long as the rest, the other 99% of the requests. Sometimes the thing's out doing, you know, doing some maintenance, doing some housekeeping. So it's really the equivalent of your commute time going from 15 minutes to 30 hours. Oh, sorry, 30 minutes, 15 hours. That's like the nine, not five nines or nine fives. Um, so for enterprise disks, and this is one of the defining features of enter enterprise versus consumer SSD, it's really how much performance stability you're gonna get. How, how consistent the performance of that disk will be. In this case, we're, part of our assurance is that it's within plus or minus 5% every request performance stability. So, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's not just we take the good wafers and put them in an SSD case and charge it a lot. We take the iffy ones and throw them into a plastic case and call it a consumer-grade disk. Under the hood, every, every category we have, every line of disk, has a different mix of on-disk, RAM, different controllers, different workflows and how they manage the data on disk. And it makes a big difference. It makes a difference in cost in many cases. But it's not just all about SSD. I also want to turn my eyes to the venerable HDD as well, because there's room there too. We're not only, you know, a lot of cases storage innovation is happening at both the top end and the bottom end. Sadly, and I know we had a, a moment of silence earlier for uh, what was it, S, uh, I forget what technology we killed off in the previous discussion. But certainly, as we're working with SSDs at the high end, spinning this to the low end, a moment of silence for 15K drives. Um, their days are numbered. We're coming for you at 10K probably too. Um, SSD is starting to encroach into the high end spinning disk. Um, but certainly at the low end, um, spinning disk is still important. We're now shipping 10 terabyte um, drives. And there's some really valuable uh, uh, reasons for going with extraordinarily high density spinning disk. But more importantly, this is the one that I, I want to point out to a lot of folks. And I mentioned it to someone yesterday about just, in our technology, it's sometimes important to kind of take a step back and question the ground you stand on. Some of those truisms of, if I need more performance, I buy more spindles. In this case, it's RAID worked for me last year, will it work for me next year? And so while we talked about things like mainframes are dead, um, somebody said, shoot, I forget what technology we killed off. Was, that, was it? Okay. They said that's dead. And someone, someone said, no, I've still seen one. RAID, for, no, for, for, for all intents and purposes, RAID's going to be killed by high-density drives, um, or at least become a very risky proposition. We did this um, thought study with NAS quality consumer, RAID, or consumer drives. And you'll see that when you get to six terabyte drives, 
in a six drive RAID 5 array, um, bit wrap becomes a real challenge. Essentially, the, the error rate of the, sub, of the substrate exceeds the amount of bits on the disk. And so during a rebuild, there's a 91%, around 91% chance of a read, read failure on, a, on, a, on an array rebuild. Now obviously, at the, the second group of numbers at the bottom are our enterprise level disks. They have a higher level, um, a higher, one order of magnitude higher, better error rate. And I'm not sure how to structure that because having a higher error rate is not good. But um, at any rate, so the numbers get depressed, but it certainly spells the end of, of RAID as a disk protection. So we're looking at the emergence um, across the, the, the storage spectrum of things like erasure encoding, consistency checking, um, things that RAID's not very good at to ensure that we have data durability at, at scale and at, and at very dense uh, solutions. And so this is my kind of, you know, my shill for the disk because I come from the HGST guys. And a year ago, I told you, those, those SSD guys don't know what they're talking about. The SSD guys at SanDisk would have told you, those guys, spinning disk is dead. And then we got together and we're like, oh, hey, your stuff's not too bad. Um, but we, we, are, we are seeing the emergence of extraordinarily dense solutions, and there's some value around it, not just because bigger is better. Um, these are the first disks on the market to use something we call Helioseal. The drives internally are sealed. They have a helium environment. And it does a number of things for us. It eliminates the turbulence in the disk, which means we can fly the heads closer to the disk, which means we can stuff more disks in, so we can make the disk more dense. There's also less rotational friction, so that the disks are spinning with much less power consumption. These drives are the most dense on the market. They have a 25% lower power consumption value than, than comparable air drives. What this ends up meaning is that, you know, these are archival drives. You're gonna put them on your floor, you're gonna leave them there for five to seven years. And your, the amount of power you're gonna use per disk is gonna be 25% lower. At scale, where you're putting five or 600 of these in a single rack, your power consumption numbers are gonna be significant. Now, someone used to run a data center where I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, not only for the power to drive these disks, but then the crack units to get the heat that I produced from the power to drive the disk out of the building. It's a significant cost difference. But those are those kind of cost differences over time that we look at. We don't always look at. We look at acquisition costs, we look at installation costs. We don't necessarily look at costs over time. So there's some really nice emerging technologies here, um, both at the high end, at the low end. You'll see a lot of this technology in some of the systems you're buying and you're seeing on the floors here from our trading partners like HPE. And so, you know, when you think about who WDC is and our three brands, SanDisk, HGST, Western Digital. We're, we're moving in a number of different directions. At the very bottom level, we're creating you know, technology and innovative components, industry-leading components that not only drive our own solutions, but drive solutions for our partners. We're moving up into platforms. You're seeing a lot of our JBODs starting to power that hyperscale. Um, InfiniFlash, our, the, our SanDisk brand, very high performance, uh, flash-driven, capacity storage, um, and moving up the stack into object storage solutions and, and open source solutions like Ceph, giving uh, reference architectures and, and presenting solutions as well directly to, into, the, into the partner channel. And with that, I'm going to cut a little short, get you to lunch. Um, I pretty much exhausted all my knowledge I know about disks, so while I would open it up to questions, I'll tell you that when they taught me what to do when I talk to groups like this, does anybody ask you a question, just tell them, it's beyond the scope of this discussion. We'll take it offline, we'll meet right after this, and then run like hell to the door. <laughs> but if you do have any questions, I'll be around for a little while, look for me, um, and uh, be happy to get into it. Thank you, Phil, that was awesome. Pleasure, Appreciate thank you. That.